We are recording. So um, this is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum's Oral History Project. I'm interviewing Al Hazel. My name's Hannah Nordhaus. It is July 22nd, 2003, and we're at the Stanley Lake Library. And um, I have some questions. So um, why don't we start with just um, a little personal background on your, actually, I'm going to close this door real quick for a second. I'll turn this on. We're back. <laughs> And um, we're just going to start with a little of Al Hazel's history. <laughs> so why don't you start just telling me um, when and where you were born? Oh, I was born in 1932 in Evansville, Illinois. And uh, what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father was a vice president of a milling company, milling machines. How did you end up in Colorado? Well, the family used to come to Colorado for vacations, so um, I had an experience as a child out here. After uh, graduating from high school, the next day I was on my way to Colorado. Okay. So you came here for uh, college? No, I came here to live. Came here to live. Um, did you go to college, college came afterwards. Ah. So always in the um, Denver, in the Front Range area? Mm -mm, basically in the Front Range, yes. Okay. And um, you were educated in Colorado as well? Uh, I did attend Colorado A&M, now known as CSU. Got my degree there in um, agriculture, animal husbandry. Okay. And um, tell me how you ended up at the um, Public Health Department. Well, I was looking for a job and the, um, saw an, an announcement in the newspaper that uh, they're looking for a sanitarian. Uh, this was for Jefferson County Health Department and uh, interviewed and got a job, worked at Jefferson County Health Department for a little over four years. And uh, what is a sanitarian? Sanitarian has to do with everything with regard to public health except nursing. <laughs> so, so we get involved with all the environmental issues, um, food sanitation, industrial hygiene, whole nine yards. Did you have a background in that field? Uh, not in public health per se. Uh, my degree was, had a broad enough base that it covered about everything from genetics to agronomy to, to English to the full spectrum. Okay. And so you started Jefferson County Public Health, and then what was next? In 1965, I went to, to the State Health Department, worked in the radiation program, started off inspecting x-ray machines, and uh, then uh, moved into radioactive materials regulation. We became an agreement state with the Atomic Energy Commission in 68, and uh, then proceeded just up the ladder in, in various responsibilities and so forth. What was your final job before you retired? Uh, before I retired, uh, I was, phew, no, I forget the titles, but uh, um, I was a supervising health physicist, but before then I was director of the divisions that had uh, radiation protection or radiation uh, in that division. The division went by a number of names. It got involved with hazardous, hazardous waste, got involved with noise, so forth. So it, basically the division that I was involved with always had the radiation program in it. The division originally started with air, occupational, and radiation hygiene. And it, air got split off, became its own division. Um, industrial hygiene uh, started off uh, working uh, basically uh, an assistance program to companies uh, and addressing health hazards in the workplace. And then, um, OSHA came along and we became an OSHA state and we became partners with the Department of Labor. They handled the safety aspects, we handled the industrial hygiene aspects. 
that division got split off and dealt with uh, the industrial hygiene things with OSHA. And then the uh, legislature saw fit to not fund that program, so that program went by the wayside. Noise, environmental noise came along. We had that program for a while. But basically, uh, the, the division prim had a primary responsible with regard to radiation, radiological health. Um, I have a question here that says, how did you develop an interest in radiation? And I'm wondering if that was an interest or if radiation sort of found you. Well, uh, one of the industrial hygienists now at the state health department would come around to the local health departments and we'd have look at various things that need to be addressed. Uh, there'd be, um, I'll say, workers' compensation cases that were being addressed in Jefferson County, and we'd go out and take a look at those particular places. We did uh, x ray surveys uh, of the x ray facilities. Uh, within Jefferson County, the doctor's offices, those used in industrial uh, applications and so forth. So got in, I got involved with it that way. And then just developed an expertise. Well, they had developed an expertise, uh, training, various aspects from that standpoint, and then went, to the, went with the state because they had an opening, another step up, more training, so forth. So are you interested in radiation now? or? I'm interested in retirement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's move on to Rocky Flats. Um, how did you first learn about Rocky Flats and when? Oh, my first knowledge of Rocky Flats happened to be when you just driving by it on Highway 93 on the way from Fort Collins to the ski slopes. And you see, saw the facility there, and that was, that was about it. When I went, or before I went with the state, uh, seeing as it was involved with industrial hygiene at the local level, uh, and uh, there were associations, um, you know, say, peer group operation, that uh, some of the people at the plant, and we joined in, had monthly or bi-monthly meetings, uh, shared information, so forth, uh, industrial hygiene aspects. And uh, so I got to know some of the people who were involved with, with the work, pre predominantly with regard to industrial hygiene, such as respirator protection and this type of stuff. Um, and so how, when did you become a Rocky Flats person? A person? <laughs> <laughs> Someone who's in 1969, they had their fire, and at the time of the, that the fire had occurred, why we were, uh, the people in industrial hygiene in the state of Colorado were putting on a national meeting, uh, American Industrial Hygiene Association and, and other associated groups. And in the midst of putting on that program, why the fire happened, and all of a sudden the people who were so associated with Rocky Flats said, we gotta go, we have a problem at the plant. And so that's uh, you know, when all of a sudden the big concern with regard to release of materials from Rocky Flats. Subsequent to that, uh, the plant suggested that the, the lead people at the state health department uh, do get security clearance, clearances. And so they asked us to put in applications and we did so. Uh, Bob Seek, John Emerson, and myself were the first three to get our clearances. That was in, received that in 1970. And what was that experience like? Well, you have to go back in your history to day one and every job that you had and every alias that you were known and every association that you were, had dealt with. And it just takes some time to refresh your memory and put all that stuff down. But it wasn't a particular problematic as far as that was concerned. Was concerned. Okay. And um, so once you got security clearance, mm -hmm. what, was your, what were your duties? Uh, 
primarily it was more or less a liaison with the plant, what the plant was about, what it was doing, precautions it took, that type of thing. And uh, subsequent to the fire, there were um, different things that were brought to our attention. People called and said, hey, you know, I, I think you ought to sample Walnut Creek. Okay, so we follow up on that and take some samples. Nothing exciting happening and so forth. Um, then there was a question with regard, and then uh, the uh, uh, Ed Martell et al. group with regard to the study on uh, release from the plant uh, in the, found in the soil around Rocky Flats. And uh, that got us involved with soil sampling. We didn't have any funds for that and the governor made some emergency funds available to do the initial soil sampling. APA did the analysis for us. Um, Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, you know, and we, we installed some uh, air samplers uh, around the perimeter of the plant site and also put a couple of samplers uh, on the center part of the plant site. And uh, one of the outshots of that, this was just below what they call the lip area, and when they had a strike going on out there, we noticed them driving around on this lip where they had an oil drum storage and uh, didn't seem like it was right because when they were doing their major activity, we saw elevated levels in our air samplers. So immediately following the settlement of the strike and so forth, why well, they put a fence around the area and curtailed driving in the area. So that reduced some of the levels. But that's how we got involved with uh, that air sampling circumstance. So explain again, when the strike was going on, your air... We were, we were collecting air samples, and while we were going in to collect the air samples, we saw people collecting samples on that area, but were driving around willy-nilly out there. And we called that to the attention of the plant managers and subsequent to the settlement of the strike, they put a fence around the area and only people with access could go into that area and no, there was no indiscriminate driving in the area. So that meant that if they were driving around that area, it meant that they could tamper with the... No, it had no, nothing to do with the tampering. It just happened to be that just driving in the area disturbed the dust oh. on, on the surface. They also put down some cover after that and covered the area, so, so reduce it. you get a better sample of the air? Not a better sample, it, it actually diminished the amount of plutonium we saw in our air samples. When people were driving around? When, when they, yeah, right, after they put that material down, okay. then it covered up the material and decreased this, the concentrations that we were seeing in the air. Okay, so air sampling? Air sampling, soil sampling. Uh, we also um, were sampling at that during a time frame uh, for plowshare events. Plowshare was the use of nuclear devices to stimulate natural gas. And we had two detonations within the state of Colorado. One was the Rulison Project and one was the Rio Blanco Project on the western slope and I believe it was following the Rulison project I was taking some samples as a, in the aftermath of the Rulison project um, and some samples on the western slope with regard to our regulatory control of uranium mills and on the way back, I needed to pick up the samples at Rocky Flats. I happened to be the one who lived the closest to Rocky Flats, so I got to pick up the sample. So I picked up samples and I said, well, I'll pick up an extra water sample and use it for a uh, background for tritium. As a, tritium would be a byproduct of a, of a nuclear uh, detonation. And uh, when we analyzed the sample, why we found that 
lo and behold, there was quite, about, quite an amount of tritium that was um, in the effluent of Rocky Flats at that particular time. Found it by accident, <laughs> if you will. And uh, took a while to, to um, identify where that material came from, but the, the plant finally ascertained that they had gotten a return, uh, a pit that was returned that hadn't been degassed properly. And when they dissolved the plutonium to repurify it, why it released the tritium into their, all their effluent streams, and we found it in their building drains and so forth. We did sampling on the plant site. And of course, it went down into the Broomfield water supply. And it took about four years for that to dilute down in the Broomfield water supply. So during that time, did people not drink the water? Well, the water was, the water was adequate to drink. There was no problem from a health hazard from that standpoint. Tritium was probably the least hazardous of all radioactive material. Uh, but it was the contaminant that got found its way from the plant site into Broomfield's water supply. And uh, I told George Cicero, who was the plant manager, or not the plant manager, city, city manager for Broomfield, in a private conversation that, you know, remember that Broomfield has his mouth over the plant's anus. <laughs> and, uh, which is just the way it was, is the direct connection. So it took about, uh, you know, everybody ascertained that, you know, that as far as the levels from, that we were finding in treatment, there were no real hazard to the, the public, but we did a study with regard to uh, what, uh, what were the levels that people were experiencing, not only in the water supply, but in, in their urine. So we sampled, the, the population took samples from adults and children and some infants. I don't know how this one lady got a urine sample from her child, but we had that. Uh, and her, the fellow who took the sample and had one from his wife and one from his daughter, he, the man came home and said, what's going on? He says, okay, take a sample from me. Well, we analyzed his sample and his was way down. We had to, why is this? Well, his wife was on the water supply all the time, and the only way the child got any is through the mother. But the father drank a six-pack of beer a day. He wasn't on the wa that water supply, and so it, it rinsed. <laughs> so, benefit from drinking beer. Then we had to analyze Coors Brewery, or the, the beer, and didn't find anything in there. So. All these interesting little anecdotes that have nothing to do with the issue. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's what we're looking for. That's great. So. so you got soil, air, and water so far. Mm -hmm. um, is that? Well, we we also assisted uh, one of the contractors from DOE uh, in acquiring uh, organ samples. They were interested and what people might have picked up if they lived in, a, in some proximity to Rocky Flats. And so we worked through the coroner's office, not the coroner's office. Hmm. Anyway, we worked with the hospitals and they got releases from people to take tissue samples and then we sent the samples to Los Alamos for analysis and they published the results on those, I don't remember what the alt upshot of the analysis were. Nothing alarming enough to be memorable? Nothing to, you know, say that there was a big, hairy health hazard. The, what they, the biggest thing they had to work with is to find out that these people didn't work at Rocky Flats. <laughs> hmm. So what about people who did work at Rocky Flats? Rocky Flats, uh, workers at Rocky Flats, they had their own program uh, to analyze uh, any tissues from, from them upon their demise. And you were not privy to that information? I can't, I can't say we weren't privy to it. Uh, I just don't remember any upshot of that. But there were a number of studies that well, have been reported in the literature. And if um, there was a, they were contaminated while still alive, that was, that was also the 
province of DOE and the contractors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, you said there was um, nothing to indicate from the, the tissue samples that went to Los Alamos that there was a big, hairy health hazard. What was your personal um, perspective on Rocky Flats? Was it a health hazard? Well, you know, when, when uh, Ed Martell and et al. released their information, there was a headlines in the newspapers the next day uh, by one of the people who had or was working for another laboratory, for DOE, and um, they were quoting him as saying that 400,000 people were going to die in the Denver area due to this plutonium contamination. And the way that was calculated was this is the amount of plutonium that they had estimated had been released, and if you ex ex put this in two people, enough to give each one health effect then you would go through 400 people before you use up the inventory. Well, that is assuming that the material could get into the people. <laughs> but if it's in the soil, the soil uh, has clay in it and plutonium goes to the clay just because of its chemistry, which makes it a large particle. So it's not going to get into people and it's not soluble, so the uptake into plants is not going to be there. So I spent, after Ed Martell's, the, the released the information, uh, I spent the next day uh, in front of the TV cameras responding to the networks and the local stations wanting some information to either say this is true or allay fears or whatever. That was an extremely hard day. So your personal perspective was that it wasn't a health hazard as long as the, the health hazard, I mean, it, it's a concern. First of all, the stuff should never got off site. They stored it in drums on the oil drum storage area, which became known as the lip and that in the associated areas. And it should never been stored outside, but because of demands and pressures for production, they didn't have space to store it, they stored it outside. Well, the contents of the drums were corrosive to the drums. And so they ate out the sides and got distributed on the ground, burdened the ground. Uh, and then the plant saw the effects of the wind blowing that dirt, and they've seen it collected in the air samples, but never did anything about it. So Ed Martell's study said, yes, it's gotten off to the plant site. It doesn't belong there. You guys aren't doing the job that you're supposed to. You're supposed to protect the people. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the purpose for the plant is to protect the people of the United States. And here you're not protecting the people of the United States that are in immediate proximity. So well, we had the same argument when the tritium got loose. People came up from Albuquerque office at DOE and said, well, this is not a concern. I mean, it's below all the standards. Wait a minute, it doesn't belong there in the first place. These are the people you're supposed to be protecting. It just it doesn't say, well, these are, you know, you, that doesn't, these people don't matter. No, it's the last time I heard that argument. Once I confronted them with that bold face, that was the last time I heard that argument. It didn't, it didn't exceed the standard. Then we got involved with the Allaire process where is as low as reasonably achievable below the standard. Okay, that's what you're supposed to be aiming at. Not that it just meets the standard. So um, there were no off-site deaths that were attributable that you could that you saw that could be attributable to. You know, you can calculate those, but to show that, you know, this person died from an environmental exposure in the metropolitan area due to plutonium, you'd be very hard pressed to do that. Um, and so do you, it was fortunate then that the soil was so clay-y? Had enough clay to bind up the plutonium. Plutonium's hard to get in the body, really. Without the massive exposure that they get in the plant? Mm -hmm. Because they're, then they're taking raw stuff, and, and if it's in, involved with a fire or something like that, then you can get it into the body. Or if they get contamination that's penetrating the, the barriers, 
that the body has. And if that pe penetrates, then you've got it in the body. Then it's going to be there. So, um, um, so, so most of the, the contamination that you saw was attributable, you think, to the drums or, or the fire, some combination, other releases that we might not have known about? Okay, so you know, prior to the 1969 fire, the 1957 fire was not publicized. And so that brought that whole scenario to, to, to the fore. Uh, they had other problems, just, uh, you know, non-radioactive, the, the stuff that they had for, that were considered hazardous materials, solvents. Uh, that um, basically were taken outside and dumped. <laughs> and that was common practice, not only at Rocky Flats, but elsewhere in all the machine shops in, in the United States until RICRA came along, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, that said, this is hazardous materials, you've got to dispose of it properly. The other part of that picture is, is that the plant used a lot of solvents, a lot of solvents. And after it was used in the scrubbing of, of the, uh, the cleaning up of, of the pit, why uh, a lot of that was discharged to the atmosphere. So the health department... Um, and that's hard, to, that's hard to sample for. We did do some sampling. I was involved with the study where they did do some additional sampling to try to estimate just what kind of an impact that would have had over a long period of time. So that's airborne toxics, and I imagine that's hard to differentiate between what came from Rocky Flats and what came from... Mm, except that Rocky Flats were the point source, where the other ones were, would be diffuse. Other facilities. Other facilities. All the machine shops in City and County of Denver, if you will. So the um, Public Health Department was not invited onto the plant and was not interested in the plant until after the 69 fire when that became public, is that right? We, that's when we got involved. Prior to that time, it was more or less on a professional basis with industrial hygiene matters of general concern, not with regard to the plant. General workplace safety mm -hmm. stuff. And you consult as peers with mm -hmm. health physicists there, is that? Uh, not so much the health physicists, but the industrial hygienists. Because a, a lot of the protection that was provided in those days, besides ventilation, was the respiratory protection. Uh, half masks, full face masks, so forth. And Rocky Flats was one of the first that started a uh, respirator uh, fitting program. Time frames are eluding me these days, <laughs> but it had to be. No, it had to be in the middle '60s. Is it a respirator fitting program? Yeah, respiratory protection fitting program. So making sure that somebody's. Make sure that the, when you have a ro proper seal on your mask, because if you if it's not stopping anything, you might as well not wear it. And so you said Rocky Flats was a pioneer nationally on this? Mm-hmm. Yes. No, oh, not just government facilities, but... Uh, I think they were a leader with regard to having uh, the facilities to test and looking at the various different facial types to get the right fit for the individual, so forth. So they were doing sort of custom designs? Or uh, not so much custom designs. They had a number of respirators out there, but then they made sure that this person who has this kind of a face gets the right fit. And of course, how much facial hair gets in the way and all this kind of stuff that ruins the seals. And then the, you know, the Nuka Regulatory Commission got involved with that also in their regulatory program, but this came long after the fact. The Industrial Hygiene Association started, started pushing in that area because of everybody was putting on masks, but there weren't any, I mean, we wouldn't know that they were any good. And so we participated in that. Um, when I was working with Jefferson County, I, I uh, at the facility, I used one of their americium sources to calibrate my x-ray equipment. 
didn't have to push the button all the time on the x-ray machine. I could use a calibrated americium source. So there was professional recognition. And so, um, so after the 69 fire, how, how, tell me again how it was that you got on the site. Was, it was publicized in the press and then the governor? Uh, the 69 fire um, was, in the, was in the press. Uh, and then following that, I believe it was 1970, that uh, Ed Martell's report came out. And then subsequent to that, why the plant asked some of the people at the State Health Department to be Q cleared. Then just grew as, as each new. Each new thing came along. It got deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and then in uh, 1989, when uh, EPA and FBI and DOE, the DOE uh, chairman, or maybe it was earlier at that time, the names of the <laughs> of the agency changed. Um, but the chairman uh, decided that they that they were going to raid, and so nobody had any information that it was going to happen, except people who were going to do it, and the chairman of the DOE or the AEC. Uh, and then the next day, I had taken a step down, and we got a new division director. And uh, I got a call in the night and said, would you, they raided Rocky Flats. You saw it in the papers. I want you out at Rocky Flats on a full-time basis. The governor was not happy that government was attacking government and did not want to be blindsided anymore. So I was supposed to be the eyes and ears of, of the state, specifically the governor's office. I believe the basis for the raid was that uh, they were burning hazardous waste, which they weren't permitted to do. And uh, so that was one of the reasons. Another thing that they used, and we found this out later, was that uh, the regional administrator of, of uh, EPA told us about it is that they, anything that they didn't expect to be in an effluent, uh, but they found, they caused as, a, you know, we need to investigate this area, okay? And one of them was uh, the stuff the, the bakeries put in bread wrappers to help sustain the quality of the bread after it's been baked. But they didn't expect that to be found in, in the water. And the reason why they hadn't expected it to be found in the water um, was that the water that was going into the the Walnut Creek drainage was Walnut Creek drainage would spray irrigate it and evaporate. Only some of the water drainage went off and went down to Wilma Creek drainage. And so that was an abnormal thing in the Wilma Creek drainage. And so EPA used that stuff that's normal in bread wrappers <laughs> to say, we've got to look at something's wrong here in Wilma Creek. But they called it a um, bizarre residue like this, you know, like it's blown out of, thrown out of proportion, but what it was was the, was the bread wrapper preservative. But it was coming from a bread company or from Rocky Flats? Well, they, used, they buy bread, and it, so it, comes, it was coming from Rocky Flats, but it was due to the stuff that's, that the bread's packaged in. But it wasn't supposed to be in that drainage. 
But the big hullabaloo was that this was a bizarre material that was in Woman Creek drainage. That was the bizarre material. But I, you know, I know how that works because when we were doing a regulatory thing on Cotter Corporation down in Canyon City uh, under the, um, I forget the term of the act, but anyway, it was natural resources damage claims. Uh, we expanded everything. We looked into every nook and cranny and so forth with regard to that plant the same way. And that was before Rocky Flats raid happened. So we knew how to expand it so you can cover all the avenues. And if you're going to do it, you might as well do the whole nine yards. I mean, they even went into transportation aspects. Um, you know, every shipment that Rocky Flats had made that they had records on, they went through them all. Now that had nothing to do with hazardous, hazardous waste burning, but they looked at it. So, and the, the state, so this is all federal, you know, federal violations, and the state had not been apprised of any of this before the raid. Uh, we knew of EPA's concern with regard to that there's suspicion that the, that the plant had been burning hazardous waste. And um, so did, did, it was Governor Romer, right? Governor Romer, yes. And did he feel blindsided by this raid or I mean, was, did he feel that the state needed to have been more involved in this or what, what was the response from the state side? Well, you know, I can't speak for Governor Romer, uh, but my impression was he didn't like government attacking government. Uh, there's better ways to do things, okay? Uh, and he didn't want to be blindsided again. Now why, you know, he, he just wanted to know what was going on in this state. Mm -hmm. And so my job was to be out there and if something was coming down to let him know as soon as possible. So you went out there every day? I was out there every day, sat, I was invited to sit in any of the meetings that went on, generally not the contractor meetings, but anything that had to do with the DOE, you know, any, any DOE meeting with the contractors or just within DOE, so forth. DOE brought in, first of all, they shipped uh, the manager who was there out, brought in a new manager. Uh, interim, and uh, they brought in people from other plants to take a look at things and to look to look at the thing from a different perspective. And while we would be sitting in meetings, these guys in turn, there's a state guy sitting in here. <laughs> What's he doing in here? Mm -hmm. And they say he's, you know, he's here for a reason. He knows what he can take out of the room, which is only an immediate hazard to public health and safety. And other than that, he has to leave it in here because it'd be classified. So you know, I was sitting in, in their meetings, even when the undersecretaries would come out, I'd be in some of their meetings. So were you there nine to five? Nine to five and sometimes into the nights, 18 hour days. My first office was a telephone, uh, a wall telephone in the hallway. And that lasted for about six months, and then they got me an office. They didn't want to have, the state didn't want me to have an office with plant people. So there was, um, I forget the office name, but Joe Krupar was, was the individual involved. And he was from outside, and he was an inspector. There was an inspector general's office or something like that. And so we were kind of housed in the same area. And later on, they, they gave us a building to use. And uh, subsequently, the guard people wanted, after I retired, why they, they uh, uh, the guard people wanted that for their secured area. Uh, but when I retired, they hung a sign on it, Al Hazel Memorial Hall, and I said, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> you're dead when you leave the fight, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, did you, just, were you allowed to roam at will then? Yeah, 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 yeah
I always, whenever I needed to go into any of the plant buildings, I always went to the plant office, got a ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-
Now, I had telephone access, I could call outside, but we worked to make sure that the information was not going to be ridiculous. I mean, you know, go off the wall somewhere and then have to retract the statements and this kind of stuff. Uh, we had one exercise that we, I worked on the planning with uh, and uh, was regard to a water pathway. We'd never worked a water pathway, it's always been air. So we decided, well, we're going to have a dam failure on the Walnut Creek drainage and we'll see how fast we can respond to it. See how fast not only the plant, the state, and the city can respond. Let's see if we can, if we can work this out. So we had it all set up and we got in. And one of the things is, is that uh, when we set up these emergency response in the state, uh, these, these uh, tests, why uh, once they start, you can't call them off. You have to go through with it all. The only way you can call it off is if there's another emergency, a real emergency that you have to address. So we started off with this thing, it was going along great, and all of a sudden the interim DOE manager uh, says, we're working on the wrong thing. We should be working on Wilman Creek instead of Walnut Creek. Like, Wait a minute, you know, we're doing this exercise. This is the way this thing's set up. We've got to go this way. Oh, but this other one, you know, there's a concern for the, for the dam. There's a concern for its capacity. Finally, he was pushing so hard, I said, Ed, if you, the only way we can shut down this exercise, which is in progress, is if we declare an emergency and put all our resources onto that emergency. But it has to be an emergency. Oh, yeah, okay. Everybody was, don't do it, don't do it. He said that's what he wanted. I says, okay, it's the first time a state has ever declared an emergency on a federal facility. That's what you're saying. Do it. Okay, so he turned all our expertise over to the other drainage. There wasn't a problem over there, but he walked out of his office sick. <laughs> he was sick. He was sick when he came in, but <laughs> but he was more sick after that. But that was one of the circumstances that, you know, if he just let it go, I, I told him, I says, we can save, you know, tomorrow we'll bring the same staff back and we'll look at it, but not under emergency circumstances. No, I want it done today. What, what was, why was he so insistent? He, I, I don't know what was behind his motive, but he, he was concerned that, that they, were, they needed to do some release for Woman Creek and, and C1 Pond, I think it was, that it was too full. So he thought he was thinking this is a real He was thinking that was a real emergency and, and it could have waited the day and not screwed up our effort with regard to can we respond to emergency in a public water supply? with a release from the plant site. When, when you know, talking about water supplies, we had the tritium, we had the tritium incident, and then along comes the raid and the allegation that there's mysterious substances in off water being released from the plant site. So George Cicero calls me up middle of the night that first night after the raid, and all this hubbub. He says, Al, what am I going to do? I got to take some kind of an action. So we, I know it's like an hour and a half or something like that on the phone. And finally I said, George, remember what I told you with regard to tritium in the water supply? That your plant has, it, or your city has its mouth over the plant's anus? He says, yeah, I sure do. Thank you, that's most helpful. Next morning they had surveyors out surveying the ditch to carry the Rocky Flats effluent around the Great Western Reservoir. Did they do it? Did yep, they? oh yeah, they put it in a ditch and it I was very functional for quite a while. Did you think it was necessary or a good idea? 
you know, if it calms the situation in Broomfield with regard to people and their water supply, that helped. The upshot of the tritium incident and the uh, raid and all that kind of stuff was that Broomfield got an additional tap from them for water supply. So they, they were not limited to Great Western Reservoir and irrigation ditches. So they benefited from that standpoint. Okay, so um, back to being on site at Rocky Flats, what was the atmosphere like at, you know, in terms of, did you feel like you were part of the team? Was there a lot of collegiality? Uh, I wasn't part of the team per se, I was an outsider. But uh, I was treated very cordially. Uh, I had a job to do and people realized that if I didn't get my job done, they were in trouble. <laughs> so so uh, there, was, there was a good spirit of cooperation. Um, I was wondering how, how um, the goings on at Rocky Flats may have changed the public health department. I mean, did they, you mentioned sort of that, that your specialty sort of branched off and got more specialized as time went on. Did Rocky Flats have anything to do with that or is that just the evolution of public health? Well, it's probably a combination. Um, whatever you're involved with always affects the future. And every time that uh, something happened at Rocky Flats, whether it was tritium, whether it was something else that went on the flats, we benefited from the legislature giving us some money to look into different things. So that always benefited, got us involved with. Uh, with um, the studies that have been done at Rocky Flats, now here's epidemiology that got involved with uh, some of the studies and the conduct of some of the studies so that there was, say, more latitude or broadening of the studies so that uh, the study couldn't be questioned so easily, if you will. Um, and so there was a benefit from that standpoint. You know, Ann's work with, Ann Lockhart's work with uh, the Rocky Flats effort uh, from the state's perspective helped with, with that particular thing. So there were a number of things that uh, you always grow with the experience. Um, so you mentioned that you question, what direction did you get from your managers at your agency related to Rocky Flats or from the state? I, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned that obviously your on-site career mm -hmm. was specific. Was, was there any other? Direction? No, it was mainly to keep them informed. Uh, one interesting circumstance was uh, uh, the governor in, invited various segments of state employees to come to the mansion for a Saturday picnic. So I took my family and we went down to that and as I walked in, the governor introduced me to his wife and said, Al, now, what's your home phone number? And I gave it to him and I told my, there goes the weekend. <laughs> sure enough, Sunday morning, this is Roy, Governor Roy Romer, and uh, he wanted me to come down and have breakfast with him. Well, breakfast started about 9 o'clock and, or 8.30, and I left him about 4 o'clock. What he wanted was, he wanted to be knowledgeable on the terminology with regard to radiation and anything that had to do with the plant site. And Romer was a quick study very intelligent person. And so this was mass feeding. I mean, this is intense. Fine and dandy, that was no problem, okay? The big problem came when I came to work the next day and my bosses said, we understand you met with Roy Romer yesterday. What did you tell him? And I said, well, here's, you know, I went briefly, here's what I, what I did. Just he wanted to become familiar with the terminology so that he knew what, what they were talking about. So, well, would you write all that down for us? Because we don't. <laughs> it took me three days to put that thing together. 
dictation, huh? Oh, man, you know, try to remember what I told him. And I had to send a copy down to the governor's office. This is what I, this is what I think I told you. If not, this is what it is. But that's, yeah, that was, that was intense. So sort of the message from your higher ups was? Communic oh, communicate. Right. That was, their big message to me was communicate. Communicate with the governor's office, but don't leave us out of the loop. Right. <laughs> we don't want to be blindsided. And it seemed like the people who worked above you didn't necessarily understand what you were up against, or what you, and they didn't understand it nearly as well as you did. Is that well, well, you know, the language, the terminology is one thing. And when Tom Vernon was there, you know, he'd say, I don't understand when you're talking about, you know, uh, use a, 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 not a slang word, but a, a abbreviation for something. And I said, well, you know, think about me when you talk about your medical terms. And, and this kind of stuff, it's the same thing, okay? And I says, okay, just spell it out for me at least once in the paper <laughs> whenever you're doing, spell it out for me so that I don't get confused. So, but the big thing was communication. Did you have difficulty getting the information you needed from Rocky Flats at any point? No, I, I can't say that I did. The big problem was I would get the classified information and then the problem was trying to present the information in an unclassified way or whether you could talk about it at all. Couldn't talk about production schedules. You couldn't talk about design. That wasn't really my, my effort. My effort was in public health, but to understand how you get to a public health hazard, you gotta to backtrack to the, to the classified. And so that sometimes presented a problem. And, and you're higher, the people you had to explain this to didn't have clearance. Um, well, finally, the health department director got cleared, Romer, Romer got cleared, uh, Romer's assistant got cleared. But the problem is, then is you couldn't talk classified information in their offices. <laughs> so you had to go someplace else that was screened. And periodically, as I recall, they'd screen governor's, the governor's office. So we, we could use that. Green, yeah, in other words, see if there's any listening devices or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> Very involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have any personal safety or health concerns ever about being on the plant site? Well, like I said previously, when I went into, into one of the facilities, I made sure that I contacted people so that I had somebody knowledgeable so I wasn't going to step into anything that I shouldn't be involved with. Um, probably the most hazardous thing I did on the plant site was take air samples, and sometimes in a windstorm. So, uh, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get involved with anything, and I did have uh, bioassays and this stuff and never found anything. but. If I, if I was going to calculate a hazard from the air sample results, you know, I could calculate a hazard for myself. But realizing that I wasn't coming into my body, it couldn't come into my body that way. The particles would be too large. And it doesn't get absorbed out of the gut if you swallow it. So uh, from that standpoint, I really didn't have a problem. But going into the, into the buildings, yes, I wanted somebody who, who was knowledgeable on the building, and that could keep me out of nice stick, sticking my foot in it, <laughs> okay? But we always you know, went into, into all the buildings. And in fact, we did um, uh, emergency maximum cuttable accident scenarios and went into all the storage facilities and that kind of stuff. And it was only later that we got the full inventory numbers, but we had uh, and from first-hand information with regard to what some of the inventory, some of the inventories were to calculate the hazard. If something happened and if it was in this particular form, then this kind of stuff. But we, we visited some areas. In fact, 
because of the people we had on our staff who had worked at Rocky Flats. They knew where some of the skeletons were and some of the people on the plant site didn't know because the one individual, he was involved with the cleanup of the uh, uh, 1969 fire, so he knew where some of those residues were and they didn't have it. So, beneficial. Institutional memory. <laughs> yes. All right, I, we're, uh, our tape's running out, so let's, I'm going to stop this and uh, put a new tape in. Okay. Um, did you have any frustrations with the legal limitations of your job at Rocky Flats? Or your work at Rocky Flats? Well, um, I didn't consider that I did. Uh, federal go uh, state government doesn't regulate the federal government. <laughs> and so knowing that, um, you generally found ways to get an agreement or to work things out. So I wasn't in the regulatory side at all. The only time I got involved with any kind of a regulatory aspect was with regard to the uh, soil standard, the interim soil standard. And that wasn't regulating the plant site. That was uh, offering uh, guidance to uh, uh, local land management agencies. And actually that was uh, at a suggestion from the Rocky Flats attorney, the DOE attorney. It says what you need to do with, the, what's going to be needed is if there's contamination off site, local government needs to know if, how to judge the circumstance. And so the health department developed the uh, soil standard. DOE attorney was the head attorney for? Rocky Flats plant. Rocky Flats, okay. Um, well, since you're talking about the soil standard, let's, let's talk about the soil standard. Okay. <laughs> um, this is the 1973? Well, actually it was in 1970 that uh, there was, I think it was 70, more shortly thereafter. Um, that by executive order, uh, Dr. Roy Clear uh, issued uh, an interim soil standard, which is an emergency one, it's good for 90 days. And it was based on the background that we found away from the Rocky Flats plant. And uh, we sent that out to the local land authorities and then uh, set a date for a hearing. We went through the hearing process, adopted the 2D prim per gram soil standard, and uh, provided evaluations to local, local people. Uh, then in 1973, the Board of Health went into it further uh, and then in, it was 76, went into it in detail. Uh, Dr. Carl Johnson got involved with this circumstance. Uh, then they went into detail. We did a very um, detailed analysis looking at it from different standpoints and estimated that the standard that we had set after giving it to EPA and asking EPA saying, you know, Where's your standard? Can you give us some guidance? EPA, because of international impact, because they've had broken arrows in foreign countries, couldn't issue one. <laughs> so we were, we were stuck with what we had. And we evaluated and said, look, there's about a factor of 400 safety in this standard, looking at many different ways. And the Board of Health says, until something better comes along, we're going to stay with this. So that was in 1976, as I recall. Um, and uh, that was for offsite, was not regulating the plant site at all, it wasn't intended to regulate the plant site. There was only 
an area of ground to the directly east of the plant site that was in excess of that. And uh, the plant, with the cooperation of the landowner, did some work on the land that tried to reduce it, and I think they did get it down below the standard. Whose land was that? I don't know who owned that land. Whether it was Broomfields, it was right, uh, right directly across the street from the, uh, on the east access road. Had a lot of rocks in it, and that was part of their problem. You can't, can't count the rocks in the, into the dilution. <laughs> Some notes here about um, Leroy, Moore had, Leroy Moore had said that there was some controversy about the 1973. Um, there was a, a 1973 standard. Uh, it, it went on for a number of years, and finally it was in '76 that the Board of Health said this is going to be it until something else better comes along. Was there an increase from January 73 to March? Was the interim standard put in in January 73 or something? And then in March it was raised? Yeah. Yeah, that's when the first one we had was based on uh, the background that we found out in eastern Colorado, East Burlington and down around Canyon City and so forth. Uh, that was the first one. And then because of I think it was eight tenths of a DPRM per gram or something like that. Then we raised it to to two DPRM per gram, and my rec my recollection was for variances in background and in analytical technique and so forth, just so that you're not um, causing a problem where there isn't a problem, just because it's statistical. Uh, that came through uh, through the hearing, the hearing process. And it was out of that hearing in, in like you say, 73, that uh, before the Board of Health, that the, the, the 2D prim program was, was the one that was established. As a public hearing where people had input as to mm -hmm. what yes. the best sampling technique was with the best... With, with everything that was going on at that time, and it was based on our technique, so forth, because there was no standards for soil. There was sand, sand for air, but not for, in water, but not for soil. In the state there are no standards? Or Nationally, no? internationally. Internationally. Yeah. Why was that? Because they were concerned about worker exposure or, or general public exposure, but not for soil. It's, soil doesn't give you a problem. It's whether you eat it or breathe it. So this Colorado was the first soil standard? That's correct. Have there been one subsequently? Oh, I don't know that there has been. Uh, some cleanup standards have been set uh, for other radio radioactive materials, cleanup of uranium on, on artillery ranges due to penetrators uh, and some of this kind of stuff. Um, even got involved with um, plutonium contamination in a disposal site up in New York. And they had a spot of contamination. And we had a discussion at the Buffalo, New York Health Physics Society meeting. It's a small group of people. And here's DOE experts and myself sat down. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to? judge this cleanup on this site. Finally, some smart person said, how big is this? Oh, it's about this site and about that much, and about a pail full of material. Why don't you just dig it up? <laughs> I mean, it's just simple, like, simple analysis. We also got involved with the proposal that um, the plant suggested, some of the technical people on the plant suggested, there was a a company up Sunshine Canyon or Boulder Canyon, a small uranium mill, custom uranium mill, that had a process where they could sort material by particle size. 
And seeing as plutonium went with the clay of a particular particle size, that maybe they could use this process Wiffle table to separate out the plutonium. Good thought. So they were going to take, they wanted to have permission to take some dirt up to this facility and give it a try. Well, we regulated that uranium mill. And we said, no, you're not going to take the butane and contaminated soil up there. If you want to check the procedure, take some similar soil but not contaminated. Take it up there and see how it separates. Do a dry run. And it's not going to violate their license. So you don't have to worry about that. So they, we knew what the facility was and the, the transfer points uh, were not covered and so forth. So here's this dry stuff and it, they ran it for about a minute and you couldn't even see in the, in the facility. I said, you're not going to do that up there. <laughs> it's a good idea, it had some merit from the technical standpoint, but in application, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> Is there so much dust So much dust. You just made it into an airborne hazard. Wow. And you just contaminate the facility. If it, if it had been real, you'd have to contaminate the facility. Well, good thinking for the dry run. Huh? Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not as simple as you think it is. <laughs> um, so what, what's the, so tell me the, the deal with composite soil sampling versus what the other option is. Uh, okay, the other option is individual samples. And the problem we had, plutonium analysis of soil is, it's complicated, plutonium analysis is complicated in itself. Uh, and then when you have soil and all the minerals that it has in it and then to get it a pure samples and, and a one layer, one molecular layer deposit on a plant chet to be able to count it is problematic. So if you had a thousand <laughs> samples, uh, the cost is enormous. Okay. However, if you have, a, have an area in realizing that the distribution of material is going to be statistical also, so why not use this statistical process and take it from a composite area and use it that way? Because if anybody's going to be exposed to it, it's not from this little spot here, it's going to be from the area. So. But the reason why we started that way was that I can't remember the number of samples that EPA agreed to analyze for us, but it wasn't over 25. So we had to do a composite. There wasn't any alternative. Um, and so people who are opposed to the composite sampling feel that it doesn't accurately reflect the hazard? Well, if, if, if you had your druthers and could analyze every speck of soil, you'd remove the plutonium, <laughs> okay? But it's, it's just the feasibility of doing that many samples. It's just the national budget <laughs> can't do it. Okay. Um, did you um, feel that, um, did you ever feel that you were exposed to harassment or criticism for your work with Rocky Flats? Everybody in their job gets criticized. <laughs> so, no, nah, not really. Uh, I was treated well by, uh, by all people. Uh, and uh, what I, I was really amazed um, with the way the, the Rocky Flats people, both DOE and uh, their contractors, treated the people who were against Rocky Flats. Uh, sometimes the people against Rocky Flats seemed to um, attack some of the individuals at the plant site, and the people didn't respond in a like manner, which was amazing to me under the circumstances. Did you feel that you were ever attacked by the people? No, that? not really. Um, you know, I, I understood people and their, and their concerns. Some people were trying to explain something that happened in their lives and Rocky Flats was available to blame it on. Uh, the only thing I didn't appreciate, some of the 
anti-Rocky Flats people, I'd be out of town and they'd call and, and my, I, my wife would be terrified with their nonsense on the phone. Because they'd call and... Now, I, you know, I was a public servant. I had my phone and my telephone number in the phone book. And I'd take calls from the people, but this was, this was nonsense. And I told my wife to just unhook the phone, hook it up when you need it. Uh, it, well, just going from what my wife said, you know, heavy breathing on the phone or somebody who was, you know, oh, I had trouble with Rocky Flats and, you know, and, and, you know, I'm deformed because of Rocky Flats, this kind of stuff, and you've got to do something about it. And they'd call back repeatedly, and I said, just unplug the phone. Were they people seeking help or were they just... Just harassment. That but that didn't bother me. I that's fine. They want to. They just turned me off to your concern, really. Did that happen a lot, or in the? It happened period? periodically, like on the anniversary of something or other. And I, when it was in the news. Yeah. Not always the same person calling. Couldn't tell. I wasn't there. Huh. Um. Well. Anne told me I should ask you about the Radiation County Facility. <laughs> the Radiation County Facility. And how you got concrete for the room. How oh, we got concrete for the room. I'm sure there's some story about that. Hmm. The original counting facility was supposed to be go to the University of Colorado Medical Center. AEC was going to donate it and they, what they wanted was some research on uranium miners. But there was such wrangling within the hierarchy of the medical facility <laughs> that they couldn't get an agreement to who was going to do that, whether what they wanted to be done was going to be done. So to still make it available to Colorado, they made an agreement with the state health department that they would put the county facility in uh, the uh, uh, basement of the um, 4210 East 11th building. Uh, it was interesting from my understanding and my recall is that the iron for that came from pre-World uh, War II bridge demolition. They melted it down and built it. When they went to install the slabs that went into the structure of this, they had to, the building was, the State Health Department building was already in existence. So they had to swing it in through one of the side entrances <laughs> with the building right next door and, and the crane operator where it was great. I didn't see it, but uh, they did this. But before they got, all of a sudden somebody got to thinking, we need a better foundation under this thing because these, the, the shield is massive. I forget how many tons, but the door was like two and a half tons. And uh, so they had to go in and tear out the floor where the founding facility was and put in a foundation that would support the, support the counting facility. What? Um, originally, it was intended to do uranium miner studies. Uranium miners had got involved with lung cancer because of radon exposure mm -hmm. in high concentration. And P.W. Jacob was head of the, of the radiation program at that particular time, uh, was, a, was a researcher in uranium mining and radon. So um, it was built primarily for that purpose. However, uh, some of the early work that the department did was for the medical facilities where they had patients undergoing various studies, such as uh, the uptake of iron in some people who just don't absorb iron and some other people who are like magnets, sponges. Uh, people who are... Um, losing uh, calcium out of their bones rather rapidly. 
We did a number of studies there. We did studies with regard to worldwide uh, fallout. That was one of the first studies that, we, that they went, did there. Uh, then when uh, Chernobyl went up, why uh, we did studies on people here in the metropolitan area to see whether there was um, any effect from any carryover from the iodine. We did studies with regard to uh, uh, radium dial painters. There were still a number of those people who were still around. And one lady was from Geneva. She made the rounds of the different county facilities, basically calibrating <laughs> all of us. She was a calibration source. Um, we did studies with regard to um, people who had um, who were obese and they were on special diets and they wanted to see whether there was any shift in, in the potassium that was in the people, which is, has to do with your lean body mass. So we worked with the medical community on a number of those studies and also Fitzsimmons Army Hospital. No Rocky Flats stuff though. Uh, Rocky Flats, Rocky Flats, the counting facility did not use the massive shield for Rocky Flats, it used um, vacuum air chambers so that there wouldn't be any air because you're, you're kind of trying to count alpha and, and alpha, anything gets in the way of an alpha, it stops it. So you need to have, you know, a vacuum to be able to count. With. So we had to set up, uh, you know, we started off with one, one chamber and a vacuum system to an array of like about 24. Uh, with all the detectors in to, to do that. But that was in the county facility, but not in the massive shield. Uh, we did look at soils from that standpoint, but that mainly looked at radium. And, and uh, uh, if there was a massive con uh, contamination from americium, which is one of the byproducts, when they got units back, the plant got units back, uh, and they'd clean them up, they'd milk the americium out of them because it was a nuclear poison. It would absorb neutrons and not allow the, the criticality to go with as fast as it should. And so we looked at americium in soil, but it, it would have to be a massive concentration to be able to see that. That's my recall, and now maybe after I left they did some more work in that area, but I don't don't recall. We got involved with flyovers by a DOE contractor, it used to be, a, what was it? Anyway, it's out of New York City. It used to be the Health and Safety Laboratory, uh, and then it, the name changed. But anyway, they came out. Uh, when we found the uh, radium uh, mills that were in Denver, and the radium deposits that were in the streets and all this kind of stuff. We figured, how are we gonna do all this to find out where all this stuff is? I mean, we can't go log every place. So we talked to DOE and DOE brought in their flyover helicopters, their contractors, and they did a scan of all of Denver. In fact, they were not supposed to fly downtown Denver, but they flew downtown Denver in between the buildings. <laughs> and. Uh, they did, you know, and they, while they were here, they did the Rocky Flats area to redefine from their gamma measurements, the distribution of materials. Um, and they identified some sources up in the foothills that are your old mine pits <laughs> to have high radium. <laughs> so you know, those are the kinds of things we got involved. It was very helpful to us because that really helped them where we should look but radium has high energy gamma emitter and are very easy to detect, very easy. Um, how did uh, local politics or state and national politics affect your job? Well, it made it busier. <laughs> um, you know, Governor Lamb and Tim, Rep Representative Tim Worth had their own committees and they had local government representatives and so forth. Uh, it made the, the liaison 
more because they wanted more information, so you'd have to bring out the information again, explain it, but in layman's terms, which was helpful because then we could go to the public and already had practiced. <laughs> um, but it, um, it was more work, but when you're dealing with the public, that's who you're serving. <laughs> so it's called public servant. <laughs> okay, um, any other stories, events, happenings, activities um, what, in your experience with Rocky Flats that we haven't covered? No, I think that uh, we've kind of covered the waterfront and left out a lot of the details, but I, a lot of the details I don't remember anymore. But when I retired, uh, they didn't give me a gold watch out of the flats. I had clearance longer than some of the people out of the plant side. <laughs> but when, when I fully retired, which was 99, um, why, uh, you know, I had to leave my clearances and that kind of stuff. And it was kind of like, gee, you know, that was, that was important, you know. I had to let it go. Uh, which was fine, and it was like I drive by Rocky Flats and says, oh, you know, wonder what's going on in there. Boy, I'm glad I don't have to go in there today. I mean, just because it just had to bother with it anymore. <laughs> and it, the whole situation has changed now. When I was out there, there was so much going on. Not only was, you know, the, the problems with the plant site and the release of materials, but also them evaluating whether we need to be in the weapons business anymore. And then they made that decision, then the next shoe to fall is where do we go from here with this plant site? And then how do we clean it up and where does it go? And that part of it, I wasn't involved with. But I was there during a very interesting time frame when they were in full production, when they were making their decisions, of, you know, do we really need to be in production? Is there another way to do this? so forth. So um, I was in there at the right time, but he asked me specifics on what went on and all the stuff that I knew about. No more, it's, it's gone and then that's fine. But it was, it, was a, it was a great experience. I wouldn't want to live it again, but once was enough. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me uh, what your attitude was towards Rocky Flats before you became involved with the issue and then how that changed as you became familiar with the plan. Well, primarily the liaison with the people out there was strictly on a professional basis, uh, industrial hygiene. Uh, then we got involved with monitoring, exchange of information, and so forth. Uh, the people, individuals out there, professionals, uh, doing their job. I never had anybody tell me anything that was wrong. Uh, if they had to make a statement that they didn't believe in, or how, that's not the right way to say that, uh, if they had to tell me something that wasn't maybe they were going to go further into this, but didn't want to let on at that particular time. You could tell they were up front. But the, the technical people in the pursuit of their job were great. They were human. There were some mistakes that were made. Definitely like the storage of those drums. It should have never been done outside. And every once in a while, you know, you, you seem like you, there's somebody said, let's store this outside. <clears throat> I don't care what it is, don't store it outside, okay? That's why they put up all those tents out there. You don't store it outside. Uh, so, you know, the people I worked with in the emergency response center were rapid fire people. They knew the plant. They knew what to expect. They knew what actions they need to happen. This, if this happened, then this needed to happen. And so, you know, they were great. Sometimes they couldn't express themselves to the public very well and they had trouble with that. And when you're dealing with classified information and the other parties not class, you know, not Q cleared, how to communicate that. 
you know, leads to frustration on both sides. Uh, but you look back on it and say, hey, you know, there's been a lot of things accomplished. A lot of things accomplished. Uh, the people who were against Rocky Flats, you were kind of a conscience, not necessarily an absolute conscience, but nevertheless a conscience that says, you've got to look at the broader picture. Fine. Uh, the people in the plant site were, were doing their job, as far as that's concerned, and the job kept us out of a conflagration. The Cold War was a necessary evil. And it gave us time until we got a lot smarter. <laughs> okay? I don't think we're still smart, but we're still in the process. <laughs> okay? But, you know, all those, that plays a role in the growth. Everything that you experience is supposed to help you grow. At least that's my philosophy. And so we've been through this, we learn from it. We don't have perfect knowledge, so we're still in the process. So it was, it was a good experience. Uh, but once through life, I don't want to have to go through it again. <laughs> How did you feel about, I mean, did your attitude towards nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons pr production and um, the safety issues change over the years? Well, I, you know, I wasn't in the process of, or in the line of making a decision whether they built or didn't build nuclear weapons. Um, that was not my responsibility. But you must have had an opinion. Uh, more is not good. But that, uh, that was either with a knife or with a nuclear weapon. It's, it's not good. Uh, but for the time and the circumstance, you know, we, we had this buildup of weaponry, and the other side did the same thing, stalemate, 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 until it overbalanced the system so much that the, the countries went downhill. And all of a sudden, the leaders realized that they were destroying our own country in the Cold War. So then the walls came down. And so now we, 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 you know, seems like we have to have a war somewhere around the world, someplace, to, which doesn't make a lot of sense. It just does not make a lot of sense, but human nature. And we, we conduct our own, we conduct our own wars. Hmm? How, do you, how do you get along with your husband? At times we war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and other times, you know, and that's part of the process. Um, how would you, this is sort of a broad question, but how would you assess the effectiveness of your work with Rocky Flats? Oh, I won't go down in history as, as, as some uh, person who led the world into something or other. Um, I did my job. I think I did a good job. Uh, my job was to communicate and to get along with people and to exchange information and to investigate things. And I think I did that. Uh, could I have done better? Possibly. Did I do a bad job? No. Um, did your work on the Rocky Flats issue change you? Well, all your life experiences change you. It, it broadens you. And the more you, the more you get involved with life, the, I think the milder you're getting. If you don't, then you're going into a, your own black hole. How, do you, how did this particular experience change you? Oh. It was interesting. Uh, the experience of Ed Goldberg, the first interim plant manager, was very interesting uh, with his six months there. Then the next person that came in was uh, Bob Nelson, happened to be Episcopal priest, and he was supposed to be there for six, six months, and he ended up being there for 27 months. Uh, we sat on opposite sides of the table. We had different opinions, and yet we were open to one another. 
uh, he was uh, an interesting guy. I'd come into his office because the governor's office wanted some information and he'd have a, his front office with 50 people and waiting to see him on various topics. And I'd walk in and he said, Al, what you need? I said, uh, about five minutes of your time, the governor's office wants some information. I'll come back later seeing as you're busy. Oh no, I'm in the office right now. All these other guys, oh! Because yeah. they had crisis on there. Going to his office. It'd take us 15 minutes because my business only took three minutes. He wanted to relax and settle down and get his mind straightened out. So we'd sit and chat for a little bit and then he could go out and dress the other ones. <laughs> so that happened, uh, that happened once in particular that just, oops, excuse me, yeah. that, uh, that they were just boom like that and just, he needed some space and he used me for that space. And that was fine with me, I got my job done. <laughs> so, very interesting and, and um, he retired from DOE and uh, he had some kind of a project that um, he was working on for DOE and he'd come into town, he gave me a call and said, you know, I'd like to talk with you. I said, well, yeah, let's go up to Louisville and have some spaghetti. Okay, so I asked my wife, I said, you wanna go along with us? Oh, you guys are talking business or whatever. No, we're not. We're just gonna talk. So she reluctantly went along. Well, she thoroughly enjoyed herself because we talked about when he retired, he took his re retirement money and bought an RV that could be divided in two so that his wife, Kathy, had her space and he had his space. <laughs> and he, he was a radio buff, he was a photography buff, and he'd get bonuses from DOE and He'd put it into telephoto lenses or in this kind of thing. And uh, Kathy caught hold of that. And all of a sudden he'd get a bonus and she, would, she was into stringed instruments. So she'd go out and buy a 12 string guitar. <laughs> so, and my wife was just eating this up because, okay, that's just conjugal marriage. I mean, you just, <laughs> you go and think, you know, here's an Episcopal priest going through the same process that everybody else is going through the same process. That was great. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the Rocky Flats site can ever be truly decontaminated. Oh, if you mean taken down to levels that are consistent with the natural environment, probably not. Down to levels that are safe, probably yes. Uh, my own idea, you know, you hear all kinds of proposals, but uh, the way we encroach on, on uh, natural habitat uh, is atrocious, <laughs> causes all kinds of problems now. And uh, having it as a wildlife preserve makes an awful lot of sense because there are natural deer herds that are on there in, in the first place. So it, that makes some sense. But as far as, you know, cleaning up down to pristine levels, yeah, there's no way. Will it be okay for the wildlife the levels? Though? I think so, because most of that material uh, is unlikely to be absorbed into great concentrations where it would be hazardous to the wildlife or to somebody who eats the wildlife. One of the first studies that they did after they found contamination released uh, following the Ed Martell was uh, they had used to have, Mark Church used to have cattle grazing on the buffer zone before they bought up all that area. And they, I can't remember, I think it was the EPA Las Vegas that analyzed the, the uh, tissues from those cows. And my recollection is that they only found trace amounts in some of the organs like bone well, we don't eat too much bone, but you know, it did go apparently into the bone. So, you know, yeah, there is some absorption, but generally into the organs that we are generally not concerned about. 
And um, you, you were gone by the time all the cleanup decisions mm -hmm. were yes. so that you haven't been involved in that. Mm -mm. Oh, well, the only, the only involvement I got is, was um, for the Rocky Flats. Uh, uh, it was um, Ellen Mangione's group uh, that was looking at various aspects, and one of them was the plutonium standard for cleanup. Well, you know, they were hanging on this uh, plutonium and soil standard, which was for offsite purposes. And all of a sudden, people go, well, you know, if it's good for offsite, it's good for onsite. If we can get it down that low, why, that's fine. Makes sense. The Lara, low is it's reasonably achievable. But under the circumstances that they have, you know, on the, on the pad, I called it the lip before it's called a pad, to take that down to background levels, I don't see how, unless you've got the national debt to play with. Uh, but there were still people who were bringing this up. And the DOE contractors were haranguing. As well, as, you know, they, they asked me to make a presentation. So I made a presentation on it. And so they got up to you know, challenge me. I said, well, if you look at the 1976 report to the Board of Health on page such and such, it says there's a factor of 400 of safety involved with it. Now, how do you apply it? And one of, the, one of the members of that team from the plant said, he answered your question, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> so that's your experience with the cleanup? That was my experience with the cleanup. What's the factor 400 mean? Well, in other words, uh, the 2D per M per gram standard if you were looking at real suspension, real inhalation, real uh, generation of health risk, it's about a factor of 400. In other words, you would be, it would be 400 times the 2D per M per gram before you would start to get concern for, we were looking at 70 year lifetime, they were looking at 30 year lifetime, it's that 30 year exposure. We were looking at 70. We were maximizing everything. Right, so big margin for it. Oh, yeah. We were looking at, you know, what is the worst case scenario? How long are you going to breathe this? 70 years. Who lives in for uh, one location for 70 years breathing at the same rate, at the same resuspension term? To, uh, impossible, okay? But you do that to maximize. What is the worst case scenario? What do you think were the best, worst, or most interesting things about your involvement with Rocky Flats? <laughs> so, um, I think the best experience is the experience of people both on and off the plant site. Um, the exchange of information that went on. It was trying at times, but uh, People grew with the experience. There was uh, a, a great appreciation for the people who, although you know, anti Rocky Flats, anti war, so forth, that had. Um, what do you want to say? Um, any tactic works <laughs> that you, you don't appreciate. There are others that were. You really had a concern and wanted to address the issues that could be addressed and knew where their limits were were good. The people on the plant site, from a professional standpoint, great, great people. Working under tremendous circumstances, tremendous pressures. Uh, people who wanted to do the very best job they could out the plant site but we're always having to address headquarter issues. <laughs> and so they address it and then they'd have to address it again under the new guidance and then the next day they'd have to address it again under another new guidance. Yeah. 
And then you look at it from the governor's office standpoint and try to address the public, the voter, the you know, national security, the, the stuff that goes on between uh, political sides, Congress. You know, how are you going to clean up Rocky Flats by the year 2006 unless you keep the feet under the fire of the Congress to continue to fund it? Because if you don't make enough noise about it, Congress is not going to fund it. <laughs> so your twix and tween and how you, the, the things you have to do to, to play that. Working with Governor Romer's office and traveling with him out to the, to the plant site and him wanting me to go along with him so that he didn't step his foot in anything that he wasn't supposed to. And yet you know, we had the plant personnel with us. So uh, to see the workings of people who had a tough job to do on both sides and seeing how they work through it all, which says, hey, we can, we can work through it, it's okay. So that's, I guess that's life. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wins. Yeah. Even though we think we're losing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, anything else that you, any stories, anything else you want to? Mm, no, I think we, we pretty well covered the waterfront. And I'm assuming you don't have any photos, books, or memorabilia since you came with that? No, I, all the stuff that I had uh, were during my tenure with the state. They belong to the state. They're in the state archives. Okay. I didn't keep anything, so I wouldn't get ready to check my private reserves and all that kind of stuff. Right. Good idea. Yes, I, so I, I'm clean. And if anybody, you know, you, with the lawsuits that have been going on in various areas, you know, the records are in the files. You want to address a particular record, you bring the record out, let me take a look at it, and then I'll give you something off the record. But, or not off the record, but from the record. So, but that's the only way. I don't have anything at home, nothing like that. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for agreeing to sit for this interview. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'll turn this off now. Okay.